Death superstitions provide a common theme throughout folklore, and it's hardly surprising. Before the advent of modern medicine and health and safety, communities may have felt more at the mercy of life's whims. Following superstitions gives an element of control. And indeed, many of these superstitions also have really mundane roots. For example, hanging a dishcloth over a doorknob meant there would be a death in the family. That said, this could stem from the tradition of tying crepe to doorknobs to let people know that the household was in mourning. Now, I have covered death superstitions around cemeteries before, but these are some of the more general areas of best practice to try and avoid a death in the family. So let's take a look at these death superstitions in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello then, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. As you can potentially discern from my voice, I am struggling a little bit with a head cold. And yes, as far as I know, it is just a regular head cold and not anything more nefarious. Now, as I say, we are going to continue our Halloween theme this week with death superstitions. And obviously, I've covered plenty of omens that people used to see of death coming and other superstitions that people used to follow to do various things, but I thought it was quite cool to actually collect eight superstitions together and then actually dig into them a little bit as well. So this is as a part of our all things ghoulish and weird that we're having here in October, because when else are you going to do this kind of stuff? I mean, obviously, if you meet all year round. But anyway, let's crack on with this week's episode. So the very first death superstition that we're beginning with is the one that says that you shouldn't break a mirror. Now, I know it's more usual that breaking a mirror brings bad luck. And after all, according to an article from 1889, breaking a mirror would bring seven years of bad luck. And it was also even more unlucky to keep the broken pieces. That said, in Wellington, it was believed that if you broke one mirror, you had to break two more. and That would then cancel out the first one, which just seems a little bit over the top, if you ask me. Now, the idea of seven years bad luck actually dates back to the Romans. And I think part of that is because for them, a life actually renewed every seven years and that included the soul. So breaking a mirror would damage the soul that was reflected in it at the time. Now, but the contradictions in this kind of folklore do appear quite early because early American folklore recommends immersing the pieces of a broken mirror in water for seven hours. And this was not just any water. It had to be water that was flowing south. Alternatively, you could grind the pieces into a powder so you would bury the broken pieces. And either way, the mirror couldn't reflect anything anymore and then that would cancel the bad luck as well. But elsewhere, to break a mirror is a sign that there will be a death in the family before the end of the year. And in Switzerland, it was said that the last person to look into the mirror was the one who was going to die first. Babies under a year old just shouldn't look into a mirror at all. And speaking of mirrors, it's obviously best practice to keep them facing the wall while the corpse is in the house. Because if you don't, anyone who uses the mirror will die within a year. There are various reasons why that may be. And I think one of the ones I came across was the idea that the soul might then get caught in the mirror and then therefore they would then drag the soul of the person who looked into the mirror with them into this netherworld. And obviously there are two other death superstitions related to mirrors and that's if a mirror actually falls off the wall and breaks, someone in the house will die soon and anyone who sees their reflection in a room where someone has died recently will soon die themselves. And I think that's linked into the same idea of the soul becoming trapped in the mirror. Now, the second superstition is to watch how you go around funerals. So if you arrived at a funeral after the procession had started, it would bring death back to the house. And if you counted the carriages in a funeral that passed, you would also die within a year. Also, whoever the dying person last looked at before death would be the first person to die among those assembled at the bedside. Incidentally, graves shouldn't be left open overnight or they would herald another death. And leaving the side of a grave before the grave digger lowers the coffin means that another death will follow. And also the first mourner to leave the cemetery would also be the first person of the assembled people to die. So basically it was quite a good idea to try and leave last among the mourners as much as you possibly could. You also need to be careful with your scissors, which is our third superstition. And according to Jacqueline Simpson and Stephen Rowd, if you drop scissors and the points stick into the floor, it's a sign of impending death. 
And according to another author, it's even worse if a seamstress drops her scissors because that means that she'll soon get an order for morning wear. Whereas in Greece, if you leave open scissors on a table, it means that Michael the Archangel has opened his mouth to take the soul of a family member. Now, obviously, I would also point out as well on top of that, that in many places, people would actually hang scissors above or beside a door so that their blades fall open and that would stop evil creatures from coming in. So again, you do have a little bit of contradiction going on within these superstitions. Superstition number four is to try avoid sitting with 12 other people. Now, having 13 at a table is generally noted as being bad luck, but in Somerville, Massachusetts, the person who gets up first won't last the year. By contrast, in Brookline, the last one to sit won't die that year. In Germany, the folklore also varies, so the unlucky victim might be the youngest, the last to sit, the first to eat or get up, whoever sits under a mirror, or whoever seems downcast. So I think in a lot of ways it's probably best not to sit with 12 other people just to be on the safe side. But in Bohemia, there was a belief that specified all of this kind of folklore only applied to Christmas dinners and the rest of the year you were fine. Now, the 13 Club was created in the 1880s to try and debunk this superstition, and it did have over 400 members by 1887, including Theodore Roosevelt. And some people believe that the superstition dates to the Last Supper. The story could be even older, and some scholars have mentioned the idea that in Norse mythology, 12 gods arrive at a banquet, Loki intrudes, making it 13, and then later on the beloved Baldur dies as a result of Loki's trickery. Now, I do have a fuller episode on why people fear the number 13 if you are interested in that superstition. Now, superstition number five is that you shouldn't carry tools through the house. And in Mansfield, Ohio, it's the hoe that becomes the unlucky harbinger of death. If you do carry a hoe, you can reverse the bad luck by carrying it back out again while walking backwards. Alternatively, you can take it back out of the door that you came in. In the UK, it was more likely to be the axe or any sharp tool, and it only applied if you carried it into the house on your shoulder. Spades were also especially bad luck due to their association with grave digging. And we also all know it's considered bad luck to open an umbrella indoors. Well, it only becomes a death omen if you then hold it over your head. So I think that probably dates from the days of the Victorians, when I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Victorian houses, but they kind of went for what you would call maximalism, but just taken to the nth degree, where every flat surface would have something on it. And clutter doesn't even begin to describe the decor style. And I often feel like the superstition probably dates to then because the earliest umbrellas were really unpredictable and they're not like now where you just push them up and away you go. Some of them had really quite excitable mechanisms, shall we say, so it would be particularly bad luck to open an umbrella indoors at the wrong moment and then thus knock your furniture over or break ornaments and all that kind of thing. So I do think that's where that particular one probably comes from. But then adding the death omen on essentially just adds insult to injury, really. But the sixth superstition to avoid death is to avoid making plants bloom out of season. And in many places, the blossoming of fruit trees out of season does become a sign of impending death, but also so does leaving a single fruit after gathering the rest. However, in Oldenburg in Germany, the blooming of a fruit tree or a rose in autumn meant that someone in the house was not long for this world. Now, it is clear that there are no doubt good reasons for some of the death superstitions, and I can't help thinking for these ones around fruit, because some berries in particular are susceptible to moulds or bacteria after the natural season, it's entirely possible that people would therefore become sick and potentially die if they were to eat this unseasonal fruit. So coming up with a superstition as to why people shouldn't eat them was an easy way to avoid the illnesses associated with the fruit. And again, it's a little bit like the umbrella one. It's somebody's taken something really mundane and annoying and then added a superstition to it to try and get people not to do it. So I think that is indeed where that one comes from. And that you might have actually heard the superstition that you shouldn't eat blackberries after September 29th. And the idea is because that's when Lucifer fell from heaven and landed in a blackberry bush And he was so annoyed about all the thorns that he spat on the blackberries. And after that date, that's why you're supposed to not eat them. But in actual fact, it's because of the moulds and various other things that grow in them. They're just not safe to eat after that date. But what's an easier way to get people to not do something if you attach a superstition to it? So a lot of superstitions are actually cautionary tales. But I do think that they're quite interesting when they're related to fruit in particular. 
But on to our seventh superstition. You should watch out for certain animals. Now, dreaming of a white horse was a death omen in both Bohemia and England. And more specifically in Sussex, white animals that appeared mysteriously at night also warned that death was imminent. Now, the 1889 article I was reading about this did suggest that that might be because certain early gods and some saints, like St. Valperga, were said to ride white horses. So it's entirely possible that they were then being associated with figures that you may not necessarily want to encounter, either because the, the figure was divine or the figure was basically out fighting evil. So you wouldn't want to be wherever they were. Incidentally, if a bat circles your head three times, it predicted a death. And an Illinois superstition claimed that a bat getting into the house and staying for a long time meant that a death would occur in the house, although it doesn't actually specify what a long time means. If the bat left soon after it got into the house, then a relative would die, so not necessarily somebody in your own home. And meanwhile, in Arkansas, just dreaming about a bat flying into your house was enough to kill a dear friend. And I can't help thinking in a lot of cases here they've picked bats because of their association with all things nightly and vampiric and things like that when actually bats are pretty cool they're probably not likely to fly into your house because they've got their sonar and so on and obviously a lot of the insects they eat are actually more problematic than the bats are so there we go i think if a fruit bat flew into your house you might notice but generally speaking bats are quite good at avoiding where people are and there is of course a superstition that if a moth flies to a candle and puts out the flame it means someone in the house will die and moths are fairly attracted to light and they're really easy to get into the house so I can see where this one may have come from so it's symbolically putting out the light so therefore it's going to put someone's actual light out if you know what I mean. And finally number eight listen for strange noises. Now if bells ring somewhere in the house of their own accord it foretells a death and likewise if broken clocks suddenly strike or tick when previously they hadn't been it also meant the death was coming. Hearing three raps somewhere in the house meant that a family member had died and perhaps most famously the sign of ticking in the walls means that a death will happen in the house. Now I should point out with that one there is a further version that's a lot more specific and it does say that the tick must happen only three times each time it occurs for it to be counted. Now there is also a belief that the knocks must be heard in threes at regular intervals and this one is actually supposed to be death knocking at the door asking to be allowed in which I do think is quite polite that at least you know death knocks first. But the ticking is a really interesting one because in earlier times that was much more likely to be the sound made by the death watch beetle and indeed there is an episode on beetles in folklore as well. But the reason why I find this one quite funny is because the Beatles actually make the ticking sound. I think they're hitting their head off the wall to attract a mate. So I do think it's quite interesting that somebody's heard essentially the mating calls of a Death Watch Beetle and then decided it's actually a death omen. So there we go. At least you know what that uh, what that ticking is. Which does, I think, add a little bit extra to certain narratives like Poe's Telltale Heart and things like that. You're like, oh, what exactly was he listening to? But I would say watch out for unoccupied rocking chairs that move of their own accord because one superstition claims that this means that there's a death that's going to be in the family while another says it's rocking because a spirit of a family member has returned to claim the next to die. And I can't help thinking that's perhaps one of the reasons why they're a really overused visual image in horror films. And indeed, I was actually chatting to David Southwell the other day about this on Twitter that it is a really lazy cliché. And I would say like something like, a, you know, a deck chair that unfolded itself and then the fabric just flaps listlessly in the breeze. That would be a little bit more terrifying, I think, than a rocking chair moving of its own accord. But there we go. At least there is a superstition attached to that particular horror film cliche. But they are basically the death superstitions that I decided to gather together because there were certain themes among them. And like I say, there are certain themes that I think make sense. So those ones that act as cautionary tales to avoid injury or illness in some way, it's easier to remember the superstition than it perhaps is to remember the why behind it. So again, it's one of those things where you can more or less terrify people into behaving, the, not the correct way, but the way that's actually going to bring them the least amount of harm. And I do kind of wonder how many people would continue to follow superstitions like that when you consider how much public health guidance does get ignored by people despite the fact that there's a good reason for it. I know every time there's been like a norovirus outbreak and they're like, make sure you sanitise your hands, you still get some people being like, you can't tell me what to do. And I'm like, well, enjoy norovirus then. 
<laughs> so I think that it's one of those things where like it's not exactly a superstition it's just best practice we just don't wrap them up in superstitions quite as much anymore although I'd love to know how many of you actually still follow superstitions so how many people avoid walking under ladders which again common sense you don't want someone dropping something on you or you don't want to accidentally knock the ladder either or how many people still throw salt over their shoulder and so on and so forth so if you do have any superstitions like that that you follow please do feel free to let me know in any of the usual manner, which is obviously the comment section on the blog post that's linked in the show notes. If you're on YouTube listening to this, obviously you can just post straight into the comments and that's quite easy. He can always tweet me, things like that. So I hope that you enjoyed this little whistle stop tour of death superstitions in our Halloween month. I am about to send out the storytelling mini episode to Patreon supporters if you are interested in getting that one. And this is basically about a stolen bride, which is quite an interesting story. So if you are interested in receiving that, then you can become a Patreon supporter or otherwise known as member of the Fabulous Folklore family, which kind of sounds a bit like a cult. And you can join that and there's loads of bonus stuff and bits and pieces. So you get quite a bit for your money by helping me to make the podcast. Otherwise... I will see you next week and we're going to basically do a little bit of gallows folklore because there's quite a lot of weird folklore and things associated with the gallows. Like, for example, I've seen some people talk about the fact that the mandrake apparently would only grow below the gallows. No, it doesn't, but that's a side issue. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to have a look at next week and look out for some other special bonus episodes throughout October because I've got some interesting things coming up. But anyway, I'll let you go now and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record, and edit these episodes, so if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles, and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below, and thanks in advance.